Hello again. Seems just like yesterday when I last saw you. So, yeah. Welcome to our second in the series. And uh, I, I, I want to add, you know, again, another reason for coming to these is that all of these people who are speaking to you this week and next week are the people who will be your reviewers, either for your second year reviews or your first year reviews. So it's always kind of nice to get an inside view into their practice and what kinds of things you might ask them. And I intentionally did not include a question and answer. Uh, I think in the past, maybe tradition was that there was a question and answer period and it just drags it out on and on. I think it's better that you have the sidewalk conversations, that you pull the heirs into your studio along the way and ask them questions when you see them elsewhere and, uh, and have your own private moments. And, um, and there are always times for questions together. But uh, Tonight, I would like to first welcome Rebecca Ripple. Rebecca has exhibited through the United States and Italy at venues including Cloud and Man, the Los Angeles Museum of Art, the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena, and the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art. She is our sculptor in residence, our artist in residence for the sculpture department, and she came to Cranbrook from her Broad Beth studio practice in Los Angeles, where she held teaching positions at California State University, Northridge, University of California, Riverside, and California Institute of the Arts. Rebecca has received multiple awards, including a COLA, which is from the City of Los Angeles Individual Fellowships, and a Nathan O. Freeman Endowment for Exceptional Creative Accomplishments Award. Her work has been featured in Sculpture Magazine and reviewed in the Huffington Post, Art Scene, Artillery, and American Craft. Rebecca's recent installation, House of Poetics, was shown at, at New York City Governor's Island installation. Uh, that I think, is that still going or did that come? It's down, but that was that was her big event this spring summer that sh that she was very intensively working towards, and realized. Rebecca also has an upcoming solo exhibition at Cloud and Man Gallery in L.A. Please welcome Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to try to get through a lot of material really quickly, so um, I hope it makes sense. I cut out a lot, so I, I tend to work in such a way that one thing begets another, so I'm hoping that this is going to, um, cutting a lot out is going to make sense. Um, okay, this is a poor, Im or this is not a poor image that um, Hito Stay or, uh, describes, squeezed through, through slow digital connections, compressed, reduced, rips ripped, uh, remixed, as well as copied and pasted into other channels of distribution. It is a Ripple original taken from my iPhone at 90 miles an hour when driving across the country this summer. Um, I wish I had pulled over and taken a more defined image um, of this moment, a rainbow phallus from the heavens next to a graceful um, otherworldly, next to graceful otherworldly giants, wind turbines, practical solutions to massive global and affecting issues. But it is, um, but its lack of focus and intensity reminds me of driving and my anxious energy relating to the time to get to my destination. And um, I want to do a little aside, I don't know if Emmy's here, oh, um, that um, <laughs> a note that I had this image in my um, <laughs> lecture before Emmy uh, shook the world with her troubled rainbows yesterday. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not so much interested in, in the rainbow as in the power it had over my experience. Sorry, um, a little bit of a mechanical thing, it does the opposite of what I do on my computer, <laughs> um, uh, uh, over my experience. I experienced awe from both these natural and human-made wonders. I'm trying to make sense of how I am part of what is beyond me and what is, a private com um, what is this private consciousness, self, um, and I. And my work is propelled um, because this distinction is permeable. My work looks to these intersections between different kinds of understanding, perceptions, and experiences. I am interested in the place where biological and cultural influences overlap and create new understandings or kinds of truth. I was brought up Catholic on suburban Long Island. Uh, Catholicism, Catholicism and capitalism strong, um, strongly 
uh, value different things. One fully engages in maximizing the ability to, to obtain power in this world, and the other proselytizes the denial of material wealth and looking to intangible riches in the world after death. I think this is a fundamental schism in our um, ability to relate to one another politically today. I often work with conflicting value systems, especially in relationship to power, language systems like religion, capitalism, and architecture. And I know that was a mouthful for a really crappy image, but um, <laughs> bear with. <laughs> um, um, uh, a woman in front of me at the supermarket had a growth that was hanging off the back of her arm, a sphere attached only by skin. It was both her and not her. I, I, was fully in, um, I was full of awe, disgust, and the desire to keep looking. I wanted to understand um, the attraction and repulsion I was experiencing, how this response was a concept that could be understood in words, but something fully gripping, could not, sorry, could not be um, understood in words, yet fully gripping and consuming. In Elbow, I wanted to explore ways, uh, these ways of experiencing, how uh, form and language get filtered through, through us and are interdependent with our learned understanding through a culture. At what point do we associate or conflate two sets of information and then um, are they, um, and when are they separate? In the fashion system, Roland Barth talks about how the physical clothing is imbued with meaning through text and image. Through the text, it is given an intangible aura, something beyond the physical garment, and not what the image shows. I wanted to bring you to a place between what is presented, form and language, its basic semiotics. I tried to get to the point just before the bulbous form would um, be perceived as detached from the rug and be a separate entity. I was interested in, in how sighting with text, an area of the body, an elbow, which is phonetic, and I didn't realize that for very long. I think I said that in my last lecture, but it was mortifying after so, so much work, um, uh, which um, has no clear perimeters and um, projecting it onto a mundane object. So basically, I was looking for parts of the body, like an elbow, like where does it stop and start, Thigh is another one you'll see, and where is that? You know, where are the boundaries of a thigh, um, uh, eyebrow, things like that. Um, okay, uh, I lost my place. <laughs> um, sorry about this. Um, so um, I tried to get to. A, oh, so, sorry. I want. I was interested how sighting with text an area of the body, an elbow, which has no clear perimeters and projecting it onto a mundane object, a Home Depot office rug, could um, be sexualized um, or could sexualize the sight and at least the bulbous form. Um, how could it create an object of desire? I was trying to create a vehicle where in written, physical, and represented systems coexist. So that's a detail of the rug. Uh, I tested a series of mundane objects, challenging them to be sexualized by labeling, tattooing, grafting. Can desire um, find a platform within a rational context? Thigh blind is what this is called. Um, is metal blinds from Home Depot a mundane household item? And cut out of it is the word thigh. TP lip. In tongue, the letters became the form. I carved fleshy volumes like the figures represented in Peter Paul Rubin's paintings, and the composition is specifically from The Rape of the Daughters of Lesipus. George, um, Georgia is the font, and it's developed for legibility on the computer screen. Uh, language can can change our response to form, questioning desire. Words are made physical so that the viewer must reconcile Bodily desire for um, bodily desire for something um, and cognitive understanding of these forms, abstract thought and concrete form. Sorry, I'm getting a little confused here. Bear with. 
I began to think um, of the words as voice embedded in matter. Concretizing the voice is a religious construct, fundamentally Catholic. This concept particularly interests me because of my own Catholic origins. I, my need to deconstruct its influences in my life, as well as our current social and political system. Uh, which is what it, it's called, uh, uh, um, a guttural, um, is guttural and an utterance, sometimes a pause, sometimes in pain, etc. cetera. Um, I like the rolling, um, and like the rolling wall. So basically what it is, we had these rolling walls that we were, um, you know, sort of tasked to deal with in this um, show. And so um, like the rolling wall in the art center's architect architecture, um, it's a disembodied fragment floating with the ability to adapt. It is a physical, um, it is physical, architecturally derived form um, and, an and an abstraction. It is a letter form. It is moved around the room like a kind of lumbering character. I was interested in the Catholic idea of transubstantiation. I got that. <laughs> um, uh, the word made flesh. Okay. And this is another view. In the lower right is blood cells. Um, I think they're specifically actually fat cells, but something like that. Um, a drawing, um, and the upper left is a drawing or a fragment of a drawing, and it's done in the same system as cellular packing. The network is, a stru is the structure of the space between cells. Centers are connected. You know when you draw your finger through a sink of bubbles, you can create disturbances in the mass of, cell, um, mass of cells, the cellular system. You can create words and images. I don't know, you know, playing around with bubbles in the sink, basically. I use this notion to create a word, a symbolic system of language that would interface with a biological system. So, um, the, st the structure of the space between cells is imposed onto a system of bobbin lace, culturally derived system of bobbin lace. Um, I taught myself to make bobbin lace um, used in the 14th to the 18th century, connoting the power of wealth and the elite governing aristocracy. The disturbances of the cellular structure create a fragment. Um, the fragment is Lang. Um, I think it's a morpheme, but somebody can tell me later if they know what a morpheme I thought I, I, I always thought it was a morpheme, and then to, I, I'm not sure now. Um, is uh, Lang um, from the word language, okay? And the bulbous center is um, based off of um, uh, Renaissance paintings of the Virgin Mary with the disembodied breast. So kind of going back to that bulbous form. Um, I decided that it was way too constricted and um, uh, controlled. And so I cut up the table to give more visceral body movement. The drawing that you're seeing, it's a collage getting at the form by using a Baroque sculpture as um, sort of a foil. And I was also looking at Rubens' fleshy figures uh, to um, paint and to um, deal with the form. So this is plaster and paint created um, these fleshy um, forms. Um, and you can see that, I think you can see Hopefully you can see. Uh, UAGE is the rest of language, and it is drawn onto the wall in anamorphic perspective as it um, sort of continues off into space, illusionistically. Prospect. Mace is a Macy's hand, uh, escalator handrail, restrained and held open by speculum-ended metal clamping forms. Thinking about consumerism and desire, controlling chaos and uncontrollable forces. Um, Picasso's Vagina Dentate is some of the paintings that I was looking at. So you can see the speculum-ended uh, forms that are holding in, basically, I don't know if it's a it's a steel belted um, form and it would just spring out and like it could really hurt you like it was like a tackling a I don't know like a dragon or something it was crazy in my studio and it would just like lash out if I let it go if I tried to do something to it so these these clamps are actually clamping it it was uh, they really are holding it in place um, the 
the pieces and um, the piece ends in plexiglass geometries, diamonds held by pincers and sextants. Plexiglass is a material for stored display cases. So that was in, I was basically trying to get the language of the mall. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. No wonder that, I was like, I didn't put this many images. Okay, um, uh, scorpulum um, is um, from the word speculum and scorpion. Um, mundane office flooring and um, was used and it's grid. I was interested in the grid of the panels of the floor tiles. Um, <clears throat> So the grid composition twists and pulls upward, forcing the energy into a column, a prayer-like gesture. So here you can see in my studio um, that it was um, the different colored construction paper was trying to get at how when it twisted up, how the grid remained. And I never could really realize that it became too complicated. Um, speculum is Latin for mirror, became almost um, a, a synonym for divine revelation during the Middle Ages. Jesus is a blackhead. Um, uh, I, I thought first of God in my pores. Um, so, you know, caught in my pores. Um, and the inescapability of my earlier indoctr indoctrinations. So I saw a single pore with a Jesus in it. I used photocopies of Renaissance paintings with various de um, depictions of Jesus' face, obsessively taped. Um, um, it is a visceral, it's visceral, so you can take it out of the intellect and into the gut. That was important to me. Pores are basic physical building blocks. Uh, blackheads are part of us and yet um, others simultaneously. It's kind of um, Freud's mirror stage. Uh, they are necessary and problematic. Jesus's blackhead was, um, in, in this piece, I was interested in how a system of beliefs such as Catholicism, capitalism, suburbia, or, or power of any sort can permeate our every thought and behavior. Uh, I thought of our sheer abundance of pores. Uh, Jesus's face was a black dot within the pore. The title refers um, also to Jesus as having uh, dark skin and hair, Arab, Renaissance, European, um, Europeans made him into a likeness of themselves. So that's the collection of pores. And I used a nose as a form for a representational, um, representational hanger of sorts. So basically I needed a way to kind of bring you to the, the at least I felt like I did need them to bring you to the, to the pores in such a way. So I created in my mind this sense of a nose. And so I don't know if you can tell, it's, a, it's the outline of a nose um, ending in the cross that are eyebrows. Um, I used the material language of the store um, street signage. Uh, so basically signage systems of, um, oh God, I'm totally uh, forgetting the name of them, forget it, just street signage. Um, <laughs> um, but it looked like a lot like a medical model, which I wasn't as interested in that happening. Um, I was trying to isolate a form that would hang um, under the nose, and when seeing this, I thought of truck nuts, a rubber hanging form to give verticality to the piece and hopefully keep it from being um, only referencing plastic models for anatomy lessons. So I was trying to bring it more to the street. Um, I think it still looks like an anatomy model, though. Um, okay. And then it was also important that it was hung overhead. So this is basically, you would look up into it and so that you're basically giving reverence to a monument or a dictator or a saint, you know, give it power in its um, positioning. Medusa of suburbia, um, channel letters, that's the word I was looking for, channel letters um, of S and M, uh, Macy's, or uh, excuse me, um, suburban linoleum floor patterns um, and um, uh, mirrored mylar bubble structures. Capitalism's construction of particular forms of beauty and desire, hair dyeing bonnets. So the, the bubble structures are at the top are sheathed with, a, um, with an extra layer, which I'm sorry, I don't have an image of. Um, 
and uh, I took it out and now I'm realizing I needed it. Um, so uh, it, it, it gave it this um, cellular quality of like disconnect, but yet um, it, it references hair dyeing bonnets and you wouldn't know unless you were a hair dyer. Um, and then gold, um, or not gold, chopping um, and home beautification. Uh, let's see. The plastic orange, red, brown grid. The plastic orange, uh, red, brown grids are from the kitchen linoleum flooring. There's a sequel to this piece that I took out because my lecture was getting long. Um, Dreamcatcher. I was asked to create a piece for the Oasis exhibition at Descanso Gardens in LA. The gardens were built on Tongva Indian land. A newspaper man, Elias Bodhi, uh, purchased the land um, from, uh, they were two Japanese-owned camellia nurseries um, when the owners were forced to relocate to internment camps in, t in World War II. I began to think about um, because of them asking me to think about Oasis and then, you know, I'm sort of finding this history. I began to think about um, how we decide this is, um, this is ours, um, our land, our body, our being. I thought about the bars of my uh, rental in Atwater Village in Los Angeles about being a renter, about gates and bars to mark what is ours and keep others away. I thought about the gang that hung out a few doors down in the pocket park um, on the LA River, um, how they tagged the river edges, the small circle of benches they gathered at and the street all over the neighborhood and sometimes my garage. I wondered how, I wondered how my window bars acted like graffiti um, uh, territorializing, protecting turf, yet unlike graffiti, my window bars were protecting uh, from the chaos of the world beyond. I, I thought about dream catch, um, catchers, a net um, between dream and physical world, sold in the gardens, in the Descanso Gardens gift shop, creating a myth about what is important to Native Americans. So really, they don't use dream catchers very much, so. Um, I created window bars, um, window bar dream catchers out of tags along the LA River in my neighborhood. So these are the four I chose. Um, so I repeated the graffiti, uh, I repeated the graffiti in, um, sorry, I'm trying to, <laughs> uh, re repeated the graffiti the coded language of the street to mark, um, to mark territorialize in four directions, uh, quadrants north, south, east, west, and put a spiral radiating line in addition to the gr uh, rigid grid of standard window bars, both restriction and letting go. The structure is like the fences in the Garden of Eden depicted in European uh, Victorian paintings with unicorns. So I, did that make sense? I kind of did that chopped, but basically I was repeating the graffiti, trying to create um, these dream catchers where, which were both window, windows, like bars like I have on my windows, except for a little more ornate, and also make it like a Garden of Eden. In surface tension, I was interested in changes, In surface tension is the name of the show at, at my gallery that, um, uh, show. I was interested in changes in the perception of I um, or containment, what is self. I, th I was thinking about self-involved private moments, perceptions of singular consciousness and absolute subjectivity, and the impossibility of such a state given our feelings of ubiquitousness, our responsiveness to what is beyond the bodily self, and even feelings of our own body's otherness. Anxiety, disconnection, isolation, and boredom are the byproducts of the access to unlimited information with, its, with this complete and immediate accessibility, the internet. Surface tension is a kind of ballet um, to get at the feeling or tone of, what, of that headspace. Um, the objects are acting in a uh, space, but without communicating, they are isolated. 
all of the objects have an area that is highly crafted, some fastidi fastidiousness, which I feel keeps them self-involved, contained, solitary, isolated from the rest. They have their own complexity. Meditation and mushrooms can reveal to you interconnectedness, but most people I know feel they are a separate entity and the world is outside of the realm perceived as I. I liken it to driving in the car with the window shut. There is a sense of a pulse in your ears, even though it is silent. Thoughts run simultaneously and incongruently with the outside world, separate, silenced, yet fully immersed and influenced. So the, work in the, room, the works in the room are the experience of a singular consciousness inside a group dynamic. You might think that as, um, you might think of um, the self as an area, that it is inclusive of everything around it. All opinions, et cetera, are part of self. Relationships are the definer of self. I think that that is a newer experience. I may be wrong, perhaps. Um, there is, um, there can never be the feeling of a self that is all connected. I just... Okay, so basically I said, <laughs> um, so I think it's a newer experience that there could be this all connected self is basically what I wanted to say. Um, I think that um, it is, oh, um, my experience as someone who grew up valuing and striving to be individual, the American dream, modernism, the artist is genius, not the postmodern value of artist as accountant or facilitator. Um, I struggle with this place of giving over to in to, um, to no containment or privacy, or no privacy. Um, this is graffiti fence, um, so it's um, the dream catcher reconfigured for creating a porous boundary of the ballet. And um, inside the fence is the ballet. The process I chose to make these gestures became so labor intensive and hyper focused that the works became very insular, even though they were supposed to be interacting as actors on a stage. They were physically in the same space, but never fully of their own trajectory. I like this in relationship to my own struggle to be part of the world. The gallery space created a beat or an energy of a ballet of actors. Anxiety, disconnection, isolation, and board, oh, I already said this, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So this is one of the pieces in the, um, in the ballet. It's called Barrel of F's Fear, F-E-A-R, two. So fear is um, a word language, part of our abstract conceptual knowledge system. But when it is carved in a very precise manner and obsessively sanded, it becomes no longer about fear as the text or word or language, but about the tool. The tools have, and these are tools, I think I didn't say that. Um, uh, so these are little handheld tools. The tools have the ability to hook to each other so they can be interchanged like the game Barrel of Monkeys. The tool is strong so it can actually pinch, poke, squeeze, pry. Fear, uh, uh, they, uh, they are cast in stainless steel from forms I carved in wood. They are derived from the letters F-E-A-R. Um, they are inter... Mm. Um, hold on a second. Why is it not? Okay. Uh, they are par uh, the parabolic mirror behind them um, was an attempt to bring you in close, um, so you're going in close to see the detail or you know, the intimacy of these objects, and your face was to become large so you can't escape yourself while um, you examine the forms, and that's a beauty shot. Back view of the ballet. And Godzilla um, was kind of thinking about um, the crisis of a symbolic order. Um, schizophrenia, where we are, um, where we are within the symbolic order, um, it is an exploded scale of an F of the F tool. So, um, in the fear piece, the F, 
Did, did that make sense, actually, in the last piece? Could you see an F and an E? And Okay, so the F tool um, uh, is hand -he was handheld and intimate in, in the previous work, um, but now it's become cor uh, very large and corporate signage, um, flailing um, the Tarantella monstrous. I'm not sure if the corporate signage actually comes um, across in this, um, and is translated, but that was my intentions. Um, it would be spraying light and um, a dominant force. Uh, it's vacuum form vinyl, um, um, so kind of taking on um, the plastics industry, oil industry, um, the signage of the street made from plastic. So these are the things I was thinking about, and that's um, the form that is not really, you can't see it in the, in the vinyl, it's too sparkly. So here's Godzilla. And um, this is called The Sun King. The title references Louis XIV, the Sun, the sun King. Um, it is a crown and a double-ended speculum form. It hovers like a drone emanating outward, and the curve suggests that it could be worn like a crown or a halo, but it is at gut, uh, at gut height. Um, so basically, it, it hangs around here um, with a swath of um, braided hair across it. Um, it is... Um, Materially decadent, um, both forms, um, both the crown and the halo are forms of patriarchal power, uh, religious and male. But the speculum, um, uh, it deals with feminine architecture, the interior of the body. Cork, the magnifica is a ma magnification of an action. Um, that rip when you take the foil off of a wine bottle. It can be understood as a comet or force hurtling through the room or as a magnification of the object that we know in our hand. So, so cork, uh, you know, a handheld thing would be this gesture and then this is an exploded gesture. Um, made on um, <clears throat> a carved wooden form. So basically I had a wooden form that was about this tall that was you know, sort of a cork form, but it also had the exterior in there too. Um, so it was made, so I like um, smoothed it on this wooden form uh, and then, sh um, so it was sheathed with like a, an aluminum foil that I was hoping was around the right thickness for its scale increase. And it um, was coated with copper coatings, several copper, copper coatings. Um, and then when it was installed, um, you know, like sort of the nth hour of installation and within a minute um, the rip, it, I ripped it off in the gallery and immediately hung it in the air. Um, the wine foil, um, it was an insane, insane amount of labor um, to become uh, this, you know, wine foil, right? And then um, when it was ripped off very quickly, that rupture um, being like a representative representation of an object that the brain could ponder associations with and created a moment in real time and it exists as an entity hurtling through space. So basically I was more interested in it as a gesture but I wanted you to have the connotations of something very familiar like the wine foil. And this is a different installation of it but I wanted to show you the bottom um, view. Brain, um, metaphor has always irritated me. Uh, people read the work as metaphors. I could never deny it, it was there, um, but it wasn't what I wanted from the work. So recently I read um, uh, from Senses of the Subject, um, Judith Butler writes, I cannot capture the soul that I am through any idea I may have of it. I cannot construct a pseudo idea of the soul with any notion of extension. It is not a metaphysical concept of a, a reality, but a necessarily errant mer metaphor that seeks to capture in conceptual terms what must resist conceptualization itself. Tape, um, the tape is important to this piece. It's like viscerally, sort of obsessively taping this um, to get you out of um, just being a representation, but also being in sort of a bodily action. Um, This piece is just untitled. Um, it, uh, it has, uh, the center of it is a photograph of an eye 
that's been drawn over and cut out and weaved into, and then the eye is placed into a wine foil in the back or a champagne foil in the back. Um, uh, and then these hair and things are weaved into this net, this sort of catcher. Um, the bottom is these um, champagne, I don't know what you call them, carriages um, that have been exploded in size and scale. And, and then the three colors, the red, white, and blue, were like sort of trails of my finger across the, the resin. Balzac is an experience of the street in the quiet car. Rodin, it's a Rodin sculpture leaning back. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Balzac, the Rodin sculpture. Um, it's that it comes from vacuum formed signage. It's vacuum formed plastic. Um, it's another actor in the ballet, <coughs> and it's um, uh, the, the the trying to take things from the street signage, like um, fluorescent lighting, which is now probably mostly LED, but classically um, fluorescent lighting, uh, sheet metal, and, um, and plastic, vacuum form plastic. And there you can see like the forms are vacuum formed into it, um, which are hard to see from the images. Front view from below. The Assumption of Mary or the Ascension of Mary is um, the image that I was using to, um, to do a piece this summer called Descension. Um, it's, Descension is a, col a collection of aerial views of clouds um, downloaded from the internet. Um, <clears throat> it was, this was done at Governor's Island, which was a military base in World War II, and I think even as back as far as World War I. Um, and so the families were housed there and lots of military activity took place on the island. Um, so the piece was done in the military barracks. Um, and um, so I was interested in this place um, uh, where um, protection and, um, and sort of a military language came in. So dissension was done for, um, oh, sorry, sorry. I was thinking about our politics today and the poetics um, or the protections and uh, boundaries proposed. One second. Um, and transferred um, onto the sandbags, forming a circle or a barricade. Sandbags are tools for protection and isolation. They are used in war and natural disasters by the military and civilians. It is an um, inversion of the art historical depiction of the Assumption of Mary into heaven. Having, um, so basically, having completed her course um, of her earthly life was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. So that's what the Assumption of Mary is about. Um, it is a perspective from um, a flying carpet hovering and giving an overview. The internet is also a way of traveling to new lands and experiencing without bodily senses. And that's it. 